James Gunn seems to be in complete control. And I don't mean as a, because he's CEO of DC. I mean, have complete control over all the elements that are going on. Like he talked about Superman. People are like, uh, when are you doing reshoots? He's like, I don't do reshoots. He's like, I make a budget for everything I want to shoot. And then I shoot it. And if it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it. And I'm like, dude, James Gunn, man. <laughs> Hollywood has figured it out, and they know how to handle the hate. Welcome, everybody, to Nerdy and Nice. We're going to talk all about that Variety article that took at least social media by storm with the reported ways in which Hollywood studios are looking to make everyone happy or make people less mad at them. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Taking the wrong lessons from things. (laughs) Yeah. But what we're here to do is to offer you an hour or so of a good time as we talk about all the movies, TV, and stuff out there that we love uh, beyond a galaxy far, far away. Obviously, if you know us from the Resistance broadcast, I'm John, that's Lacey, and uh, go check out the Resistance broadcast for all of your your Star Wars fix. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here we're going to talk about the other things that we enjoy talking about. So Lacey, how's it going? It's good. I'm excited to be back. We took a little bit of a week-ish off because you were at Disney World, which is wonderful and understandable and a great time for you and your family with magical memories made, as Disney would say. (laughs) But uh, I missed talking about pop culture. And this first story that we're about to get into was one of those things that dropped while you were gone. And I was like, man, I can't wait to discuss this. Yes. I So... I did watch Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Uh, I can't I can't believe you watched it. I want everybody to know so, that we were supposed to go to the movies. We couldn't go. Understandable. We're both parents. A lot of going on. So we didn't go. Two. Uh, you John. Can. Oh, whatever. John then says. Remember that part. Right. I couldn't go. Regardless, we couldn't go. So then the second tier of this was John was like, We should watch this for the first time as a watch along on Patreon. So we both get to experience it together. People can watch with us. It would be really fun. I said, wow, that's such a great idea. I would love to do that. That's so cool. Great job, John. He comes back from his vacation. He's like, yo, Lacey, I watched Beetlejuice. (laughs) I was like, I'm sorry, what? And he was like, yeah, I watched it. I was like, you, but you said, and he's like, oh, (laughs) So we'll have, that's what happened. We'll have to do uh <laughs> we'll have to do something else. We'll we'll do other first watches on watch along. But it's just funny because you pitched this whole thing. It was like five to ten minutes. Yeah, but how many time. ideas do we toss around? But I don't know. I just really liked that one. I was like, excited for it. So it was a little just all right. We'll pick another thing and we'll do that. But should I anything? I'll, so in well, we'll see. But in in what you're watching, I'll do a, a non-spoiler review of beetlejuice beetlejuice <laughs> okay. um but let's uh yeah let's get into uh what's going on what's happening human sacrifice dogs and cats living together mass hysteria enough i get the point all right john like i hinted at the top of the episode or not even top like 30 seconds ago uh there were several articles that dropped this past week while you were gone in florida and One of them was this kind of long piece from Variety, which spoke to executives, people in the industry, studios, about how to deal with toxic fandom. And they said, the article is called Toxic Fandom, How Hollywood is Battling Fans Who Are, quote, Just Out for Blood, From Social Media Boot Camps to Super Fan Focus Groups. Um, The article kicks off talking about the acolyte which you know we talk about star wars on our other show trb um which has kind of been a hot topic over the past few weeks i and you both have talked about at length the acolyte about how it was handled the aftermath the show itself if you are interested in our thoughts on that please head over to trb because we'll give them to you there Mm -hmm. um but there was a quote that i wanted to read before you get into your thoughts of this article which was it came from a marketing executive a veteran marketing executive at a major studio and they said quote 
It comes with the territory, but it's gotten incredibly loud in the last couple of years, referring to these toxic fans, obviously. They said, quote, people are just out for blood regardless. They think the purity of the first version will never be replaced or you've done something to upset the canon of a beloved franchise and they're going to take you down for doing so. So the, the, them be fighting words. Those are that's a bold statement from a, quote, veteran marketing executive at a major studio. Now, I do laugh a little bit because they say canon and beloved franchise, which to me says Star Wars. Um, but it could be really anybody because they don't tell you who it is. What are your thoughts on this article? Is there anything that really stuck out to you? How do you think people are handling this toxic? I feel like the term toxic is kind of becoming like the word woke. Like it's the first thing people jump to when they're talking about these kind of hot button controversial, we don't agree about something issues. Yeah, it's... It's really exhausting because, you know, with us being podcasters and us being online in like the movie TV space where all these passionate opinions are very in your face and loud and and that sort of thing, it does get taxing trying to like navigate that and get around that. I was just surprised at how much it has seeped its way up to these studio executives um so and i don't want to sit here and say it is having a bigger impact than we thought it was but i just think it's cowardice i that's the what i think of like like if you're like we we shared a clip last week of you and mcgregor at la comic-con talking about obi-wan kenobi and the show and you know his ideas and stuff and the whole place, and you know, a lot of people were cheering and hooting, and there was mm -hmm. like one guy booing, and Ewan McGregor points out the one guy booing, and that's exactly what this is. Mm -hmm. It's like that's happening, but in an online space, and it's getting a lot of attention, but it's also getting a lot of attention from people who disagree with those opinions and those narratives. Um, the same way. Howard Stern got popular, which was most people who listened to him back in the 80s were people who didn't like him because they wanted to look for the things to try to take him down with. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's an inevitable thing. Uh, negativity often gets the most headlines. News reports at 11, you're hearing about you know the missing dog or the kidnapped kid. You're not hearing about the good person who you know helped an old lady across the street that's that doesn't make news it's always the negativity that makes news so it's already the formulas are already embedded in our dna we are drawn to disasters we're drawn to uh bad news because we're like a fearful species so bring that to entertainment now and everyone has an outlet everyone has a, mm -hmm. one of these a microphone and and all that stuff and they're i guess paying attention to this and it seems reactionary based on you know some lesser returns on streaming services or uh lesser returns on box office and things like that um but i think too much credit is being given to that which empowers people who may be thinking of getting into that space saying like oh so if i just go on youtube with a good camera and a microphone make a few friends in the space, get an audience, I can influence, and I'm not saying he does this, but I can influence, you know, Frank Marshall on what he should do with Jurassic World. I'm going to do it. Maybe I make some money. More importantly, I can make money. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't like that this was leaked by this market, marketing executive, but I also like that it is because I feel like we're never going to get the truth from executives on how they're operating their movie studios. We talked about it last week on TRB that when you connect the dots of what actors say, like Adam Driver talking about the experience working with Coppola versus a big studio, you know, you start making connections. Bob Iger saying sequel, sequel, sequel. Um, you know, how many cooks were in the kitchen trying to close out the Star Wars saga, all that stuff. So it's mm -hmm. definitely real. It's definitely there. I just didn't realize how much they were focusing on you know, people who hate this stuff, how do we, how do we try to, you know, quiet those voices? How do we tame them and, and make them happy and so that they leave us alone? It's just a cowardice approach. And uh, it, it, 
It's just, I, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I don't like anything about this. Um, I'd like to know how rampant this is or if this is just someone trying to stir stuff up. Um, I'm not going to put too much credence in this because I just think it's crazy and I would never operate that way. It, I, I always feel like artists and people who express themselves, whether it's doing a high budget family film or an independent movie uh, about a coming of age story, whatever it is, uh, those people want to express their art and what they're making. And I understand there are people who like get hired by a big studio and they know they're going to have to work within some sort of system. Uh, mm -hmm. Whoever has their head on the chopping block with shareholders want to make sure the bottom line is good over you taking a risk with your story. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality of it. There's no way around it if you're going to make a big movie. But the people who are making the movie want to express their true uh, story that they came up with and, and put their ideas that were in their head to screen and get that realized. Uh, you know, we saw recently with Joker 2, it looks like the cut that came out wasn't what Joaquin Phoenix or Lady Gaga were expecting. There's shots of them at the uh, film festival premiere looking at each other or they're asked in interviews and it feels very game of thrones season eight with amelia clark where they're like uh did you what do you think it's it's happening uh mm -hmm. even for a sequel to a movie like joker that made it a billion dollars so there's no way around it but i just hope that this part of it isn't given so much credence or thought or consideration in those rooms by the people who ultimately get to say, no, nah, you're going to do this. No, nah, you're going to do that. Uh, it's it. I didn't come out of this feeling good. So I, I'm the only way I can salvage my sanity on it is to hope that it's not as prevalent in what they're deciding on in the end. It's definitely a tricky scenario. The article often, it doesn't s cite anyone because right. going off of what you're saying, like, do these people believe in the fans or uh, listen to these toxic people? And that's what how it's listed in this article, by the way. Um, and one rep said in the article, it's, quote, a lose-lose, and they refused to talk about this subject because it just wasn't going to be a good thing for them. Um, but what I took away from this article more than them being like, Oh, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to like, we get that. That's totally understandable. We deal with it on our, just as fans dealing with some of the voices in fandom. Um, the thing that kind of stuck out to me is that they said, in addition to standardized focus group testing, studios will assemble a specialized cluster of super fans to assess possible marketing materials for a major franchise project. I, can't help but think that this is rather insulting. It's insulting to people that work in marketing. It's insulting to creatives, artists, designers. Like to say that you're going to send this to a random super fan that has a very specific set of expectations, personal biases, experiences that they're going to look at whatever you put in front of them through a certain lens. Um, it just, it takes away what you were saying, John, which is like the artistic human value of movies and television and right. whatever type of media you're talking about, because at the end of the day, the story was told by someone else. And then they take this story, make a movie or a TV show out of it, and then the studio decides to market it. So they bring in professionals and people that have been in the industry for a long time that come from education and experience and other type of expertise. And now you're telling me that whatever they come up with, they then have to go to this focus group of who knows what, yeah. who are then going to determine what happens with these materials, these movies, whatever. I'm not saying that studios make the best decisions. In fact, oftentimes I think there are some crazy decisions from the Warner Brothers stuff where they just axed movies, Disney dropping series, um, the way things are are sometimes marketed makes no sense. Like we've talked about that specifically with the alkali. I don't think it was marketed well at all for what it was. Um, or even like Solo. Of course, we love Solo, a Star Wars story. Now I'm focusing on Star Wars just because that's kind of, I think, 
seemingly the focus of this article is franchises like Star Wars, just because it's an easy hot button topic, especially online. But I just, similar to you, John, I get worried when I see things like this because I can't help but wonder what is the expertise of the people that you're going to? Mm-hmm. Like, what do they bring to the table? And I think that this is representative of kind of where the world's at in general. Like, people are going to random Bob on TikTok to get their financial information when they should be going to an accountant. Right. Like, they're right. going to lady standing outside her uh, house in Florida for the weather updates when there is a award winning scientific meteorologists that have right. been in the industry for 30 years that are telling you one thing, but you're like, oh, well, you know, Sarah in Sarasota is telling me that the weather's fine and she's standing in seven feet oh, of water or whatever. It was named after her city, though. That's nice. Yeah, I don't know. It's just seemed, it popped in my head. Point is that I think we all collectively need to remember that there are people in these industries that are experts in their fields, whether it's marketing, science, writing, acting, et cetera, producing, and we need to let them do their jobs. And if you don't like something, that's fine. You're allowed to not like something. But when we get into the territory that we're letting those people dictate what those choices are, it gets a little scary, a little sketchy. Um, and like you said, it just doesn't make me feel great. Yeah. It, and also, I know we live in this really cool time where the accessibility <laughs> to filmmakers is easier than it's ever been. Um, yeah. I wish there was more distance between filmmakers and the studios and the fans. I mm-hmm. wish it, I wish there was that 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 invisible gap that was like oh I yeah I can never speak to you know James Gunn about his movie. But now like you know if you tweet something he may respond to you. And it's like ooh so he read my idea or read yeah, what I said. Let me poke the bear. Kind of. I know no matter what he does, I know that he saw my words and that mm-hmm. validates me and I'm going to do more of that. And I wish, like if I ran a movie studio, the only thing I would strong arm my filmmakers on is you can't, you got to take a break from social media when you're making this movie. Which like, they back. say in this article, by the way, they say yeah. that they're putting their talent through social media boot camps, erasing old tweets, how to respond to fans. I'm saying get off do. it. And that's a great point, too, because at the end of the article, they do use a quote from Elizabeth Olsen, who says, who plays obviously uh, Wanda and WandaVision. Uh, what's her name? Um, Scarlet Witch. Yeah. And she says, you know, I, I'm protected from the internet because I'm not on it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm completely off of it. So there's no need for me to be protected because I don't see anything they're saying anyway. I make some kids happy and then that's it. Yeah. So if, if you don't allow people to know that they're in your head or that they saw what you had to say, you take the oxygen away from the flame, which snuffs it out. And I've always believed that. Um, and I think that's the way to go. So I hope that's realized. And, you know, sometimes I, I sit there and I think like, man, I it actually would be great if Twitter just disappeared. And even though all the networking and connections we made for our podcasts, you know, hopefully they sustain in other ways because we built, you know, friendships. But I think some people get such access so quickly and it creates egos and it creates a desire for more and you're never satisfied so then you got to get take it to the next step and the next step and the next step and then all of a sudden like there's a lot of people that are being heard by these filmmakers and it leads to stuff like this and it just Mm -hmm. I, i wish there was that separation i wish i i really do i I, I think it's cool that people get to talk to their favorite filmmakers more maybe than they used to. And a lot of times it's great. Cause a lot of times it's like, Hey, Kevin, Smith, like me, Hey, Kevin Smith, thank you so much for clerks three. Like I grew up with you. I feel like I grew up with these characters and he liked the tweet. And I'm like, that's amazing. But the other side of it is the dark side. Uh, 
not to make a Star Wars joke, but it's the people saying like, James Gunn, you like really screwed up blank, or you did this, you did that, or I heard you're going to do this. And I, I, I wish that divide was there and there was more distance where filmmakers were somewhere way out there. Like when we were younger, like I'm never going to meet James Cameron. What, the, what am I going to like? Who cares? <laughs> I'm just going to watch his movies. Whereas opposed to now it's like, maybe if I tag James Cameron in this, he'll do this with avatar three or something. You know what I'm saying? So there's also a piece of this that you brought up, which is a really good point of fans online, Stan culture, all this stuff where people think that whatever they say online is okay even though you would never say these things to people in person yeah. and it's being perpetuated by people in the press so people say these outlandish things or crazy like something stupid will go viral and people will tweet it like crazy or repost it or share it or go on put it post it on tiktok whatever and then someone from the press will take that item that comment, that whether it's a mean comment, nice comment, whatever it is, a thirsty tweet, and will then tell the talent, talent that might not even be online, talent that would never come across it. They're then saying, hey, I found this thing. Let me tell you about it. And then they ask them about it. So then the people that say these things go, look, I got attention, even if that person isn't online. And I think that there is some responsibility, not just to the people that say these things, but the people that then use those things for clicks and attention and everything else where they're right. like, oh, someone said this horrible thing about you. What, do, what are your thoughts on that? Like, why? Why are you doing this? And it just creates this, this, like you said, microphone pedestal for these people to act like this. Yeah. And. Like I said, there's the good side of it. And we're going to get to a couple of those stories yes, quickly in yes. a moment here. Um, but if you had to make a decision to create that separation where there isn't the opportunity for filmmakers to be influenced by a mob or a trend or something, yeah, um, then it's it's I, I, I have I'm totally cool finding out other ways in which uh wonder woman is being created by james gunn yeah so yeah well we'll get to that in a second but first up is a very fun story which is dj master frank frank marshall <laughs> dj mf if you will mm -hmm. uh had a fabulous time spinning in the booth from the uh oh my god i almost said star wars jurassic world rebirth rap party he posted a screenshot or a photo of him on Twitter DJing um, and also tagged Margaritaville. So I'm assuming they had the party at Margaritaville. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start off by saying I didn't realize they were done that quickly. I thought they just started this. Like I always have a misjudgment of how short some film shoots are mm -hmm. where they're like, we're shooting for a month and then we're done. And you're like, oh, oh, you are done. Okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, oh, Frank, I mean, Frank Marshall is, you know, he's been around forever. And, mm -hmm. you know, you look at all the set photos of uh, Spielberg and Kathleen Kennedy, George Lucas and Frank Marshall, and they're all there. And he's still right here in the mix, you know, mm -hmm. 50 years later, still doing it. And looks like he's loving life. Um, so he's part of like the old guard, you know, again, we're, we keep, all these people we talk about who you know did it when it was done well and and before the social media and all that stuff all these people are in their late 70s now early 80s and mm -hmm. you know what's what what happens when they're gone you know uh mm -hmm. but seeing frank marshall like um you know me and my thoughts on jurassic world like i i i only think the first jurassic park movie is a good movie i i don't really love any of the other ones uh even though joe johnston directed jurassic world 3 respect mm -hmm. he's, he's the mm -hmm. man but uh the jurassic worlds i thought were rough to watch and they got worse and worse as they went along uh but you know this movie's gonna make a billion dollars and that's why frank's smiling um <laughs> and i'm sure i'll check it out i just don't know if i'm gonna head to the theaters but it's pretty cool to like you said i had no idea that they were even filming and now he's saying it's wrapped uh well done 
Universal. Well, or... we knew they were filming because we talked about the photos with Scarlett Johansson a couple of weeks ago. Oh, right, right. Yeah, you're right. Um, but I remember it wasn't even that long ago, maybe no. earlier this year, when we were talking about, you know, oh, Glenn Powell turned this yep. down and this person's yep. in it. Jennifer Lawrence uh, did. Yep. It, it turned quick. Yeah. Oh, oh, now I remember why I forgot those photos. Because there's no effing dinosaurs in those photos. That's <laughs> there why. Isn't, there isn't. They're, no like, they're like, here's a bush and Scarlett Johansson's eye. It's like, <laughs> welcome to Jurassic Rebirth. Yeah, it's them hiding in the grass. Yeah. It's the rebirth. We can't show the dinosaurs yet. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you pretty much covered it. But going off of Old Guard... We're going into the new guard now, and you dropped a little hint earlier, which is your boy. I say your boy because you love this guy. Like James Gunn fellow Silver King. has confirmed that there's momentum on Paradise Lost and the DCU's Wonder Woman. So someone had tweeted this. We were just talking about this fandom and fans connections with filmmakers. This is a, a positive yeah. uh, example. They asked, um, it was Octavia Superwoman is the username, said, understandable, any progress on Paradise Lost or Wonder Woman? I can imagine a few drafts being sent in. And James Gunn just replies, yes. (laughs) Simple, to the point. Um, I liked the first Wonder Woman movie, despite everybody now not liking Gal Gadot and hating on her acting skills. I enjoyed the first one. Um, I didn't see the second one. I've seen the one clip of her on the windshield being like, give me the stone that everybody makes fun of (laughs) with Pedro Pascal, which everybody, the joke is that everyone's saying that he's not acting. He's actually genuinely shocked. She's so bad at her line reads. Uh Um, (laughs) That being said, I am interested to see where they take this because we just are coming off of wonder woman not too many years ago uh which they're rebooting everything like with superman and whatnot uh who will play wonder woman so john are you excited to see a new wonder woman do you think it's too early or do you completely 100 percent you're you're bought into james gunn yeah so i i like that he responded to that with a simple yes um (laughs) that was cool he didn't have to do that Mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it is. It's funny because that's like the the good side of that story we were just talking about. But I'm not. Yeah, I'm not nervous about it at all because everything James Gunn seems to be saying is he already like somewhere on his laptop there is a diagram and our timeline with all of this stuff, and he is doing his DC version of Kevin Feige but he seems to have a complete story mapped out. Whereas Marvel, I think they had up to end game, but then they're like, Oh, we got to keep marveling. We've only been marveling for 10 years, 11 years. We got, (laughs) we got to marvel some more. And then we saw like people like, Oh, why is this happening with this? And then it started feeling more like Lucasfilm a little lately. Mm -hmm. Um, But James Gunn seems to be in complete, control and i don't mean as a because he's ceo of dc i mean have complete control over all the elements that are going on like he talked about superman people are like uh when are you doing reshoots he's like i don't do reshoots he's like i make a budget for everything i want to shoot and then i shoot it and if it doesn't make it it doesn't make it and i'm like dude james gunn man <laughs> so <laughs> uh i'm i have total confidence in this guy i i think he has the reins and uh he has the right people in place he doesn't have anybody putting their uh, thumb on his head. Um, so I am not nervous about that. Now, who's going to play Wonder Woman? I, who knows? I hope it's someone in the ilk of a David uh, David Cornsweet who is known, uh, but not a Leo DiCaprio or a Robert Downey Jr. Or mm-hmm. I feel like Marvel's doing that a little too much, where it's like the revolving door of the most popular people you know as boom. Uh, <laughs> I think he is going to try to make it how I always liked with Star Wars, which is like with your main heroes, when you look at them, you don't see Tom Cruise. You see this character, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So I, I'm excited to, to hear what he's got going on. And I feel like with him, like we were just talking about with Jurassic world, he may all of a sudden one day just be like, yeah, we just wrapped on wonder woman. We're like, what? 
Who's Wonder Woman? Who's That's Wonder what Wonder happened Woman? with Superman. We were yeah. talking about Superman set photos, and then the next day he was like, we're done. And we were both we're like, done. wait, yeah. what? He yeah. was probably laughing so hard. He's like, look at these guys with these set photos. And he comments something like, someone was like, does this spoil the movie? He's like, not even a little. <laughs> uh, yeah. And he's probably chuckling, thinking these people are just getting the start of the filming. And then mm -hmm. he's like, wait till I tweet next week that we're done. We're already done. We've been filming for two months. Yeah. James Dunn. Yeah. James Dunn. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I am hyped for you. But this next thing is something that I am supremely hyped for. Yeah. Uh, this is literally a story made for me, which is Anne Hathaway reveals that Di Princess Diaries 3 is officially in the works. She did this adorable video uh, where she used clips from the first movie where she her character Mia says, shut up. And then she had Julie Andrews say shut up and she made the two symbol. And then it, she announced that she was doing the third one. This has definitely been a fan favorite project that people have been pushing for years and years and years. Those are movies that I grew up with. I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, I could see it being something where she has a daughter or a is son or something. Is, is, is it is Star? Disney. Oh, it is. It okay. is Disney. Yep. Um, and the big question now is if Chris Pine will be involved because he was her husband love interest in the second one. Um, he's been dressing a little kind of hippie-ish lately with the long hair and just yeah, chilling. Like Jeff Bridges. At, yeah, chilling in like Venice Beach or whatever, going to bookshops. And buy. he surprisingly this past week after this this announcement happened with Anne, he's been going around to talk shows, clean shaven, short hair. Did he dye his hair? I don't know. Suits are back. No, his hmm. hair's his hair's gray. It's it's like a grayish white. Yeah. Yeah. And uh he just looks more kind of put together, which has me thinking, is this happening? Is he coming back? You can't have this movie without him. Um, and he's been hinting at it a little bit out on it. Well, like, what? What do you mean? Could I do this? So I can't help but think that either they're still negotiating or Disney's trying to do that stupid Disney thing they do, which is like, don't tell anyone. Yeah. It's going to be a surprise. And everyone's like, you can't have this movie without her husband in it. Right. Like you can't you can't do this movie. Are we is Hollywood at a point where they can't afford to hide people? Like you know what I'm saying? Like Yeah, I I I just don't get the whole secrecy thing. I understand for like reveals within the movie like oh, this character is the real bad guy or I don't know, like something That's like theater. that. That's the ultimate like, yes. like the, the 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 satisfaction of theater, the big reveal, the yeah. Sure, but when it comes to like a main character being coming back for a reboot or a sequel, it's kind of a no-brainer, and I don't yeah. think that ruins anything. What are your thoughts? Yeah, he's probably in it. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it's going to be a nice paycheck. I'm sure he enjoyed working on the other one. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, he seems like uh, one of the good guys in Hollywood, so I don't see why not. Um, I haven't seen any of these movies. I think the... <gasps> Yeah, it was well. Listen, the, when the first one came out, two thousand three. I'm saying oh, we should watch them. That's well, what I'm saying. Could happen. Could happen. Uh, I miracles happen once in a while. Yeah. That's the song from the movie, John. I don't know if I like Anne Hathaway oh. because she comes across as the look at me theater kid in interviews and stuff. Oh, like people she, are over that. What? What was that? What was that? What's that popular? British talk show where everyone's sitting on the orange couch. Graham, Graham Norton. Norton. And she does, she's sitting next to Robert De Niro and someone else. And she does a Britney Spears impression for like a minute. And you don't think a minute's long, but when a, a famous actress is doing a singing Britney Spears impression, I felt like as uncomfortable as I felt when I watched like the Scott's Tots episode of The Office. Oh, I, stop. It wasn't that bad. So I was just like, I don't know if I'm a big Anne Hathaway fan. Needless to say, I understand that these movies are very popular. I like the idea of somebody revisiting a character, especially Anne Hathaway really hasn't aged much. And this uh, is a family movie too. And it's a nice. family movie. Um, so I'm happy for, for everyone who loves those first two because I'm sure they didn't expect this. Uh, so I want people to feel good. There's a lot going on in the world. People were clamoring for that third Princess Diaries. I'm glad you got it. I hope it's fun. I hope you enjoy it. And that includes you, uh, Gilly. She's also coming back for Devil Wears Prada, too, which we've talked about before. 
as we've seen here, we had this ready to go for a previous episode where she announced she was coming back uh, with Meryl Streep and Emily Blunt. So she is just uh, doing the victory lap, getting those checks, having a good time. What about Stanley Tucci? I don't know, but I love him. Can I just say he's like so amazing? He's good. He's so good. But that's it. That's what's happening this week. That's it. All right. Well, why don't we get into uh, a little trailer time? Oh, God, I love that movie. We have two trailers to talk about today. The first one is a movie that just came on my radar, uh, Mm -hmm. but is getting a lot of buzz uh, from critics and uh, the streets and people who have seen it (laughs) or whatever. Uh, But I just think of I just think of the the step up the streets movie every time you say the streets oh yeah is that where they fight by dancing or something Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um was channing tatum in that i could see that being a channing tatum he was as like a cameo but he wasn't like in it it's step Uh, up to the streets (laughs) well channing tatum is not in Anora, which is coming out october 18th to a limited release i assume if it's as good as everyone's saying that will expand to a wide release uh just in time for the holidays to see a sex worker marry uh, a rich guy and, find love yeah but it stars mikey madison who i don't think is a household name but i know her from scream 5 which was just called scream um and once upon a time in hollywood where she plays part of the manson family mm. um i this trailer looks interesting uh, I like that it looks like a very unique story um, in the world that we live in of all these sequels. We just talked about all, all of them. Um, so I like that aspect of it. Uh, I need to learn more about it, who's making it and all that stuff. I'm not the biggest fan of her acting, though, in the things I've seen. Now, I've mm. seen her in a Tarantino movie and I saw her in a crappy Scream movie. Tarantino, one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Scream 5. Ah, ah. <laughs> but I saw the both the same version of her in both of those so i don't know what who she really is i think she's pretty young still too i think she's in her like early 20s so i don't want to judge her on that i just like if it was an actress i like if it was daisy ridley or somebody who i know has big chops at acting uh, i'd be like all right i'll go see this i need to be sold more because i'm not sold on mikey madison yet trailer looks pretty good it looks provocative it looks interesting so it's a well-made trailer uh what do you think I am 100% sold on this. <laughs> I I saw clips well, of this trailer. Tell them the story too about what you told me about the screening. Yeah. So I saw clips of this going around in the movie poster and people talking about how great it is. Because again, the word of mouth is going around how good this movie is. Um, they did a screening just for sex workers. Um, and they had a funny clip posted where all kind of the women in the audience were clipping clapping together their stripper heels like those really big (laughs) platform heels and they were all clapping with them and it was so funny and hilarious and awesome that that's actually what got me being like what is this i need to know what movie this is really so i'm happy that we're talking about it because um this is another thing that kind of came up when you were you were out uh at disney having a wonderful time um this movie looks very interesting I think that there's so many great moments in the trailer that are like, oh, this has some humor to it. She, It's kind of heartfelt. She's going to, they keep talking about how it's a Cinderella story. This girl finds a husband, you know, they're in love. She gets into some dark stuff with like Russians, apparently. Um, I'm totally going to watch this. I ho- I'm not going to see it in the theater because, you know, time. But I really hope it comes out on like a Netflix or something because I will be turning it on immediately to watch it. Uh, and I think she really sold it for me as like someone in new york like she sounds exactly like someone that you'd find in new york that's been there living on long island (laughs) that's you know living their life it's she's believable i like the camaraderie of her with the other girls at the strip club i like the idea of her you know finding a guy that she falls in love with and then gets caught up in craziness um it's right up my alley i will watch this 100 percent all right all right it is int- now would you see in the theater or i just said i, I probably am not going to see it in the theater because time but i'll see it as soon as it drops digitally oh sorry it's oh, okay 
I was looking at Mikey Madison's uh, profile because you said <laughs> she sounds like she's from New York. And guess where she's from, Lacey? New York. Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Good for her. She yeah. sounds great. She has a great New York accent. No nepotism. No nepotism. Uh, she Her parents are psychologists and she was uh, doing horseback riding, but her sister married a screenwriter and she's like, she got the bug. So good for her. Good for her. All of a sudden she, and then she ends up in like a Tarantino movie. Amazing. Doing pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the next one is your boy, Timothy Chalamet. Not my boy. And I know. Um, <laughs> I've never been my boy. No, nope. no, not your speed, but <laughs> a complete unknown. Uh, another biopic of a famous musician. This one about Bob Dylan. Um, comes out on Christmas Day, directed by James Mangold, who did a great job with Walk the Line, another biopic. Um, so this full trailer comes out. It's Timothy Chalamet maybe going for the Oscar because these biopics tend to get people those nominations. And Rami Malek somehow won the Best Actor Oscar by lip syncing as Freddie Mercury. The editing on that alone is still, I think, was such a rob. Oh, they that movie robbed. is a disaster. Yeah, it's yeah. so bad. <laughs> um but but anyway here we go we have timothy chalamet taking his shot as bob dylan uh do, are you a fan of bob dylan music uh but if not what do you think of this trailer because i know you do like how james mangold shoots movies so uh what'd you make of it i hated it <laughs> Lay it I on have, me. Lay i it have on me. so that's why i laughed when you were like your boy T timothy i find him so annoying i don't like him i don't I just is one of those actors that I see him and I'm like, ugh. and this was no different. Like I get that he's doing this whole bit as Bob Dylan and he's probably doing a pretty good impression of him. I just found it extremely annoying. And I was sitting there watching it going, am I annoyed at Timothy Chalamet, which by the way, that name, what a mouthful, uh, or well, am I mad? <laughs> or am I mad at Bob Dylan? I, I don't, I don't know. I just I found it very annoying and like he's his characters whining the whole time and they like purposefully made the women like look a little bit off. What, what, like what I don't mean? know like their makeup was not well done. Oh. Like they made them look like not like what a normal I don't know the the makeup was weird. Like they made them look uglier than they actually are. The actresses and I Maybe don't know that why they was did the that. time. I don't know. I don't know if that's the time, but this whole I just I can't stand Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> that's <laughs> fair. I hmm. don't find him attractive. I don't, which I know is like Lacey. No one cares, but at the same time, it's like that's the first thing I'm like. I have no no interest in what he has to say. I don't think he's a good actor. I think he's one of those things that people oh, have gotten like. I'm just saying people have gotten really on like the, oh, he's the one of the greatest actors ever. No, he's not. He no, I meant Dune. Yeah, he's spicy because of Dune. That's why. Yeah, I just, I don't know. Give me something where he's good because I haven't seen it yet. Uh, Sorry. And that I, includes the Wonka stuff everybody was talking about too. Yeah, you're bringing the fire. I, I'll generalize it and say like, I'm not a big fan of uh, music biopics. I don't think they're necessary because I think most of them already have better live um performances captured documentaries interviews mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. like i said bohemian rhapsody the end of the movie is the live aid show and you could watch the actual live aid show they have it it's just so go good watch it. Yeah. go watch it uh but and, and james mangled has lost a little luster because of what happened with indiana jones i don't think uh, he's doing star wars anymore by the way i don't know that he is either uh but this one, I thought the trailer was fine. I don't think he necessarily sounds much like Bob Dylan, which I know people say like, well, it's his interpretation. He's not doing an impression. It's like, yeah, but if you're doing something about a musician who sounds a certain way, you want them to sound like the person. It was distracting. Yeah. The way he's talking in this whole thing was distracting. Yeah. Well, Bob Dylan has a very weird, distinct voice. And it's sort of like, you know, how everyone does a Christopher Walken impression. It's like, but imagine someone playing Christopher Walken for 90 minutes. You'd be like, this is weird. <laughs> just... And and that's what this is, because Bob Dylan has a very unique, mumbly, gravelly voice, talking voice. 
and it's Timly Sh- Timothy Chalamet with his like pure honey glisten throat smoothly crooning uh trying to sound like him and i i just i i didn't buy it um so i'm sure it's well made i'm sure they're gonna do the freer consideration it's coming out the right time christmas day um but and and like i said a bad movie was able to get an actor a best uh best acting oscar best editing for a horrible editing in bohemian rhapsody so he very well could win an oscar for this um, but I'm not interested in it either, quite frankly. And I, I would like to know if, you know, we probably have listeners who love Bob Dylan. I don't know, you know, what our demographics are for Nerdy and Nice yet. Uh, I, I'm more curious to see what people who love Bob Dylan think of this. Um, and my guess would be they probably don't care that much either. I just don't think that Timothy Chalamet uh, moves the ticket. Like if well, he's in a movie, I'm not going, oh, I'm seeing that. And that's fair. There, there, you know, there are people who he does move the ticket. So there's that. Maybe. Um, but the only music biopic I think would be an incredibly good story would be Fleetwood Mac. They, mm. the internal drama from that band on who slept with who, and then now she's sleeping with the drummer and the write the songs about each other and the turmoil, but they made this great music together. Stevie Nicks, like, I always said like Florence Pugh would be like perfect as Stevie Nicks. That would be an amazing biopic. Fleetwood Mac. The drama's there. You don't need to write anything. It's all there. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that would be one that would be great. Beyond that, like I feel like they're doing too many of these. Uh, I didn't see. You're a doing Rocket a Britney Man. Spears biopic. Uh, it's like yeah, that's what I mean. I'm like, yeah. come on, like I don't need that. Like it's just gonna be depressing more than anything else because the stuff she's been through is not fun. And they're probably waiting to greenlight the Beyonce one until we figure everything out. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I hope there's people who aren't like fired up about a complete unknown, which I genuinely want people to tell me what movies Timothy Chalamet is good in because I, well, they're going to say Dune one and two. Uh, they're going to say, is it good? Cause he's good or is it good? Cause it's Dune. That's my question. They're going to say Wonka. They're going to say. <laughs> yeah, i don't know little women but, yeah <laughs> well why don't we get into uh what we're watching how about that we can never leave the house and we just probably sit around all weekend and watch tv go on you go first because you uh watched a movie that you said you were gonna wait to watch with me uh, here it is folks Can't wait to <laughs> hear this for the next six months of my life <laughs> hey. um all right so well, i'll start there so i did yeah so beetlejuice beetlejuice <laughs> Um, non-spoiler review here, so I'm not going to get into any details, but it's a Beetlejuice movie. So, um, and that's what it is. It is a Beetlejuice movie through and through. Um, I went in not expecting it to be as good as the original, uh, almost impossible to skip 36 years and give us something, uh, that matches it or exceeds it. Uh, Top Gun Maverick is an exception to the rule. Um, Mm -hmm. but it was solid. I think where it hurt me the most as uh, enjoying it fully was too many subplots, some of Mm. which were completely unnecessary that you could have told that story or arc with one of the other plots. And it left a lot of like lack of closure or asking the question, why did they even tell that story? So interesting. But Michael Keaton was great. Um, he was better in the original because he had more memorable lines. I have to watch this again because I'm just trying to think of like Beetlejuice is so quotable. I'm trying to think of like what sticks from this one beyond mm-hmm. like the juice is loose from the trailer. Uh, Catherine O'Hara, incredible. Uh, Winona was okay. I She didn't really remind me of how Lydia was in the first one, but she was good. Um, I saw a clip of Catherine online because it's on digital now. So people are taking clips and it was a one clip where this priest is going on about something and she just goes, what? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. She's she's right back in the pocket and you could see that Tim Burton had a lot of fun with this because the, the background stuff like in the, in the uh, neither world and, when you see like how people are clearly how they died and stuff like that is really mm-hmm. funny again. Mm-hmm. So they have all that stuff. The creature team, we know people who did it, Brian Herring, Nick Kellington, 
uh, and uh, Neil Scanlon did a lot of the creature work. Uh, mm -hmm. and he, we know he's the best. So mm -hmm. that all that stuff, the aesthetic and all that stuff is perfect. It's just, I think they added one too many subplots that made it sort of like, oh, wow, we're at the ending already. But what, what, what why did that happen? And why did this exist? That mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, but I enjoyed it. It was fun. I think you'll have fun with it too. Um, but just don't go in expecting to be as good as the first, in my opinion, or some uh, miracle sequel that surpasses the first. Mm -hmm. um, from there, Penguin, I'm still rolling with that. That show is great. Uh, Colin Farrell is crushing it. And um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Kristen Milati, uh from um, Palm Springs, or she was the mother in How yes. I Met Your Mother, yep. Yep. Wolf of Wall Street. She is amazing in this show. Uh, so uh, thumbs up to Penguin. Uh, I'm going to keep rolling with that. And I finally saw A uh, Young Woman in the Sea, the D uh, Daisy Ridley movie where um, she plays Trudy, uh, who swims across the English Channel. And just it, it's Lacey, it's one of those like staple in, in uh, inspiration tales. They say uh, she's going to be up for the Oscar. That's what people are saying. She's really good in it. And the whole cast around her, the girl who plays her sister. It was just, I watched it on the flight home from Disney. And she like daisy knocked it out of the park the movie shot really well because it takes place in uh old school new york city mm -hmm. um it, it's just a really good movie so i recommend it and daisy really is uh, awesome in it uh as expected so uh, but i am behind i'm um, two episodes behind and only murders though so that's where I'm i am behind as well i didn't watch them because i knew you weren't gonna watch them so i waited um and she is again she goes again see see what she did there no, I, I didn't want to. I waited them. for you, but you watched me. No, 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 <laughs> that's not what I was saying. I was saying it selfishly because I didn't want to spoil it. So I was going to wait. So I didn't say something like, oh my God, can you believe this happened? And you hadn't watched it yet. That was what I was saying. Um. Anyway, <laughs> so this past week, I watched the first few episodes of the new season of Love is Blind, which is one of my favorite shows on Netflix. And it is back with a whole new group of people. Um. I will agree with what most people online are saying, which is one of the messiest couples that got engaged. They didn't move forward with them, which is really frustrating. They like didn't choose them to move forward. And everyone's like, what do you mean you didn't choose the messiest couple uh, to move forward? Um, but it's really good. And I can't wait to see where it goes from here. Because like those first few episodes where they're meeting in the pods, you don't really get the full relationships yet. You're like, I watched the is first this going to work out? Yeah. Um, then... I'm watching, I watched the first two episodes of the new season of Great British Bake Off, which is one of my favorite shows. It is just a lovely, wholesome, fun British baking show. I mean, it's the thing that got popular here in the US because it's completely different than any other uh, cooking competition that you might see here, whether it's Gordon Ramsay, which is funny because he's British, but uh, Hell's Kitchen or uh you know master chef or anything like that where it gets super competitive that's not what this show is this is nice wonderful normal people that are teachers and, and doctors proper. yeah and uh you know designers and architects and everything and that just like to bake on the weekends and then they're doing this show so it's that's just cool. it's really yeah. really nice and wholesome and i like to bake so i i learn stuff from time to time watching the show um, I've I had your baking. You're you're good. I've had your cookies. Thank you, yeah. thank you. I I try. Uh, I'm watching. I finished up the circle. I've been on a really big reality kick. Obviously, the circle, the social media competition show. The person won that I wanted to win, so that was awesome. Um, and uh, I won. I won. If they won, I won. Um, and then I have started randomly one night. I was folding laundry, and I turned on Reba. I don't know if you ever watch Reba. Have you ever watched Reba? Like that old show? I'm a survivor. Doesn't she have another sitcom out now? I don't know. But I used to watch this show a lot when I was younger. And Reba. it it came on Netflix and I was like, let me see what's up. And it, Reba. This show is funny. Yeah. It is so funny. Yes. And Who it else talks is in it? Do we know like people in it? Uh, I forget the guy's name. He's like he plays like the boyfriend and her daughter is Joanne Garcia from that show Magnolias that's been out on Netflix. I oh yeah. She's married to Nick Swisher. Yeah. Yeah. She's in it as the girl that gets the daughter that gets pregnant. 
Oh uh, yeah. Diane. Okay. Yeah, no, she's good. And then it has the woman, oh, I'm blanking on her name. She plays like basically the same role in everything she's in. She plays the obnoxious girlfriend of the ex-husband in this show. And uh-huh. then when I see her, oftentimes she's always the annoying neighbor on like these Christmas movies on Hallmark or like she always plays the same type of character. But man, it is so funny. And Reba is so funny. And I was just sitting there laughing, like trying to not be too loud giggling to myself while I was folding laundry the other night because it's just it's just one of those wholesome shows you know everything gets solved at the end everybody hugs it out and sometimes that's just what you need yeah no that's that's great yeah. uh yeah I love like refinding old shows and stuff like recently I was looking to try to find where I could watch like old episodes of in living color so I, I remember watching oh, that yeah. when I was little like late at night on Fox or whatever it was. And like, it was the funniest show on TV. And like, I wish I could just watch an old episode of Living Color. Like the amount of talent on that show was unbelievable. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I like that. That's one of the cool parts of, you know, streaming and stuff. We could rediscover those old shows and just rifle through them. Yeah, um, yeah. Very cool. Um, is that it? Is that all, that's all you watched, right? That's, that's it. it for this week. All right. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of the show. We want to know what you're watching. Hit us up at Nerdy and Nice Pod on social media. Of course, make sure you're subscribed to the show. It's on its own uh, podcast feed, uh, Spotify, Apple. Of course, you got the YouTube.com slash at TRB podcast to watch the video version. If you like to see these smiling faces um, and then uh, tell your friends and rate us and all that good stuff. We're trying to grow Nerdy and Nice. Uh, we need your help to do that. Uh, so whether you came from TRB and you wanted to listen to us talk about other stuff or you just found us organically, uh, spread the word. Tell your coworkers, classmates, friends all about what we're doing here. Hope you had a good time uh, getting nerdy and spice with us a little bit on this episode, uh, but all in good fun. Um, but yeah, we got to thank our patrons, patreon.com slash TRB podcasts. Uh, tiers start at $5. Uh, we're working behind the scenes on some new stuff we're going to be doing for Patreon. Uh, and we do a lot of exclusive stuff and going to be doing more exclusive stuff for nerdy and nice specific content. Uh, so check it out. Uh, if you can support us, it means a great deal because it's just the two of us who run the, uh, these podcasts and, uh, your support helps us going allows this show to have happened, uh, among other, the other things that we have planned for the future. Uh, but a big shout out has to go to our movie star generals and our silver screen spice runners, the generals. Carmelo, John Reese, Jetta Rosewater, Frank Grande, Nick Kratz, Chris Morales, Brian Smith, Danny, Mike Ramori, Brendan McLaughlin, Sneaky Zebra, Dave Hornack, Jolton Jedi DiMaggio, Colin Cormier, Stephen Garrow, and Sachi, and the Spice Runners, David Probus, Neil Shaw, Kendall Gellner, Andrew Staley, Jeremy Myers, and the Fort Worthian, uh, and anyone who supports us in any way. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Johnny Hoey for me on social media, uh, X and Blue Sky and my movie podcast just like the movies uh we just did an episode on alien if you like uh to revisit the old school stuff that uh dudes my age liked <laughs> lacy how about you people can find me on social media at lacy gillerin and on tiktok at it's lacy gillerin of course here and on trb uh talking about star wars if you have the time, please leave us a review, especially on this show, because it is new. It helps us uh, find new people and rank and whatnot. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, and we'll be back next Monday with our 23rd episode of Nerdy and Nice. So thanks to everybody who's been on this adventure with us. You notice we've been peppering some new segments, ones that feature you, and more of that is coming. So uh, thanks for coming on the ride with us here. We're just getting started. Uh, but we hope you have a wonderful week. We hope you... we kicked away some of your Monday blues and we'll see you next time right here on nerdy and nice. We'll see you around kids. Bye.